my next task is to introduce Professor Wenger, and since somebody else should have done this, I, I need to have this written down, because her curriculum vitae is like as thick as the Bible. Um, so we are very honored to have you here, Annette, at the FH Global uh, Summit. Dr. Wenger, for those of you who do not know, is a true pioneer in her chosen field of cardiology and in her own professional life and as a researcher and as an advocate for her patient, Dr. Wenger had, uh, has led the way in, in, many, in many instances. She was, and this is very interesting going back in time, she was one of only 10 women in her medical school class of 120 at Harvard in 1954. I was born in 1954. Today, enrollment in medical school is virtually evenly divided by men and women, but I can give you one thing. In Holland, it's now 70% women and 30% men in medical school. So the times have deeply changed since you went to medical school. Uh, Professor Wenger joined the faculty at Emory in the 50s, and she was, of course, one of a handful of women. And today, she is Professor Emeritus at Emory University School of Medicine. And she's author and now woe and behold, of over 1,600 scientific publications, including what's very important, the 2007 guidelines for the prevention of cardiovascular disease in women. Dr. Wenger is best known and admired for correcting a misperception in cardiology, the assumption that heart disease is a man's disease, as Catherine was already alluding to. With her research and advocacy, she has helped the medical community understand that coronary heart disease in women, in fact, is common, underdiagnosed, and, and very much undertreated. So we have Dr. Wenger to thank for so much of what we know about heart disease in women today. She has had a vital impact on addressing the underrepresentation of women in research studies and clinical trials, and I had the honor of serving with Professor Wenger on the steering committee of the TNT trial and, and she reminded us every time how important it was that we uh, considered enrolling women in the TNT trial and actually looking at them and, and studying them specifically. And I still remember those discussions vividly. So again, great progress has been made in this area. Thanks to Dr. Wenger. And without further ado, I would like to ask her to come to the podium and address us with her keynote lecture. Nanette, please. John, thank you for that very lovely introduction. It is a delight to be with you today. And when the organizing committee asked me to do a presentation, they asked me to talk about the past, present, and future of cardiovascular disease in women. Because as we go through this, I expect you will see a complete parallel to what has happened in the story of FH. But as I said to Catherine a few minutes ago, what has happened is that this child of the FH Foundation has skipped its adolescence and is now almost a mature adult. It has happened so rapidly, but I think you will see a parallel in what we will talk about for the next few minutes. And what I want to do is, as we go through this, to give you essentially four messages, some of which you heard from John, and that is what we must do as a group, and that is investigate, educate, advocate, and legislate. And you will see that this is what we have done with heart disease in women, and where I expect you are going with the FH area. These are my disclosures. And what I want to suggest to you, and even though this goes way back to the 1800s from Victor Hugo, he said there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. He was obviously talking about the French Revolution. I would use it in terms of heart disease in women. You can certainly use it with the FH Foundation. But there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. 
Now, this is a favorite cartoon of mine. And if you look at the date, you will see it's 1991, where the physician sits across from his woman patient and says, we have studies of fruit flies, mice, hamsters, frogs, monkeys, and men with this condition. But medical research using women as subjects just never occurred to anybody. And that was the stage that I came on a number of years ago. Fortunately, this did occur to some people, and I will show you what has happened. These are the data on cardiovascular mortality trends in the US. The solid line is for men, the dotted line is for women, and you will see that through 1998, all of the decline in cardiovascular mortality in the United States was among men, and women essentially had an unchanged mortality. And then with the advent of gender-specific investigation and its translation into clinical practice, we saw this change. Beginning in the year 2000, there was a dramatic decline in cardiovascular mortality in women, shown in the red. And just a couple of years ago, for the first time since 1984, fewer women than men died annually in the US from cardiovascular disease. And as I have said on another podium, but I will repeat to you, we are delighted to be in second place and we want to stay there. Now, let's go through this journey because I expect you will see some parallels. This was the first conference ever held. I apologize for the slide, but it's just an old, old picture. And it was called Hearts and Husbands. And what the woman's job was to do at this very large conference was to see that her husband, her male siblings, and her male children were protected from heart disease. When the American Heart Association introduced its prudent diet, and this is a pamphlet still in my collection, it was called The Way to a Man's Heart, because obviously this was a man's disease. And not a few years later, when Dr. Harriet Dustin and I had a two-part television series, this was 19, I think, 77 or so, when was it? It was at 11 o'clock in the evening, if you look. We were competing with no one. But we did manage to get it on the airwaves, and we began to educate. That was the second part after we began the investigation. What I want to do is to define just a few specific steps on the journey, because I think they are important to catalog. And back in 1986, I was privileged to chair the NHLBI workshop on coronary heart disease in women because I had nagged at the NIH for almost a decade and we got a workshop. And you know, usually what happens, there's a workshop and a few months after, there's a conference. Well, it took from 1986 to 1992 until the conference happened, and that was the conference on cardiovascular health and disease in women. It was my privilege to co-chair that conference and to be the first author on the New England Journal paper, which brought this into the forefront. And we noted there that they were the flawed assumptions that women didn't experience heart disease until they were elderly, and not as seriously as did men. And we highlighted the new information, but most importantly, our contribution was to identify the knowledge gaps and those were knowledge gaps that other research, research scientists began to fill in and solve. Fast forward to 2001, and this is a report from the US Institute of Medicine called Exploring the Biologic Contributions to Human Health, Does Sex Matter? And from the prestigious IOM, we define the need for the evaluation of sex-based differences in human disease and in medical research, but importantly, translation of these differences into clinical practice. 
very, very important for all areas, but I will look at it in terms of cardiology. Then we had a whole series of randomized controlled trials of menopausal hormone therapy, because not that many years ago, women were thought to be protected from heart disease by their endogenous hormones when they were premenopausal, and then everyone was to be prescribed menopausal hormone therapy because it was good for everything from wrinkles to dementia, and heart disease was halfway in between. But then we began to get data, and these were not impressions, but they were data from randomized clinical trials. It was my privilege to be involved in these. We had the heart and estrogen progestin replacement study in women with heart disease, and the Women's Health Initiative in Healthy Women. And what did we find? We found that menopausal hormone therapy did not prevent incident or recurrent cardiovascular disease in women. And the report was that it was not indicated for the primary or secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. What this did was to refocus attention on established cardiovascular preventive therapies for women. Hormone therapy did not solve women's problems. Then we had from the AHRQ, just a few years after that, a report on the diagnosis and treatment of coronary disease in women. It was a very comprehensive, systematic review of all the relevant research. And what did they find? That, again, as recently as 2003, most of the contemporary recommendations for the prevention, diagnosis, medical and surgical treatment of coronary disease in women was extrapolated from studies conducted predominantly in middle-aged men. And obviously, they were fundamental gaps in knowledge. Then we began to see the advocacy. In 2004, not that long ago, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute's Heart Truth Campaign, introducing the red dress as the symbol of heart disease in women. And the same year, the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women. Not that long ago, just 13 years ago, and then Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease, beginning to show the importance of education and advocacy in all of these endeavors. And then we had some studies specifically for the first time directed to women. In the Women's Health Study, looking at aspirin, what did we find? That aspirin prevented stroke, but not incident myocardial infarction in women younger than 65 years of age, and that was totally different from the physician's health study conducted solely in men, where aspirin provided protection against myocardial infarction, but not stroke. Good randomized trial data. And then very important data in terms of clinical care from the Crusade Quality Improvement Registry. And these are women who had a non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And what did we find? That the prognosis of an acute coronary syndrome was worse in women. They had more hospital death, myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, need for transfusion. But in this high-risk population, they were less likely to receive coronary intervention, they were less likely to receive guideline-based medical therapies, even though they were so high risk. And therefore, I think we all asked the question, was the worst prognosis related to their baseline risk or to suboptimal admission and discharge therapies? And I raised the question, was this biology, was this bias, or was this both? And I expect we will find out that it was both. Then probably something that was paradigm changing, and that was the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute's Women Ischemia Syndrome, or WISE, study. And what this did was to look at women who were sent to hospital for a clinically indicated coronary arteriogram. These women had documented myocardial ischemia at non-invasive testing. And surprise, when the angiograms were examined, 
at least half of them did not have obstructive disease in their epicardial coronary arteries. At the time of WISE, everyone would have shrugged their shoulders and said false positive non-invasive test. And I think we've shown that that is a phrase that must be eliminated from a vocabulary. This was not a false positive non-invasive test. This showed myocardial ischemia. It's simply that it was not due to obstructive disease in the epicardial coronary arteries. And we began to realize that there was a great importance to non-obstructive coronary disease in women and to microvascular disease, and that it was the myocardial ischemia that killed. Then we had a few specific studies for women. The Women's Antioxidant Cardiovascular Study and the Antioxidant and Folic Acid Cardiovascular Study, because all of these were prescribed and loved by the women uh, in terms of preventive therapies. And what the randomized trial showed, that was vitamin E, C, and beta carotene, did not prevent incident or recurrent cardiovascular disease, and that folic acid and vitamin B supplements didn't prevent incident or recurrent disease, and sometimes the combinations were associated with adverse outcome. And believe me, it took me a long time to take away these vitamins that the women just loved, rather than the therapies that were life-saving. It did remove ineffective therapies from the recommended preventive regimens and focus on those with documented clinical benefit. Then we had the Get With The Guidelines uh, database. And what it showed us is that women who had an ST elevation myocardial infarction had almost double the mortality of their male peers. But this was predominantly in the initial 24 hours. And in those initial 24 hours, women received less early aspirin, beta blockers, reperfusion therapy, and timely reperfusion. It was not that the physician said, I'm not going to treat the women as well as the men. This was simply that these ST elevation myocardial infarctions were unrecognized, and therefore the life-saving therapies were not applied. And what it gave us here was the opportunities to decrease gender disparities in care and thereby improve clinical outcomes. 2010, just seven years ago, the report on women's health research, again, from the Institute of Medicine. And they identified that medical research had historically neglected the health needs of women. This is what I have called in a prior public publication, Bikini Medicine, where women's research involved the areas covered by the bikini bathing suit the breast and the reproductive system, and the rest of the woman was totally ignored. And the IOM said that women's health involved two things. There were sex differences that were the biologic factors and gender differences that were affected by broader social, environmental, and community factors. And the IOM identified that if we are to reduce cardiovascular mortality, we need greater research attention, not solely to morbidity and mortality, but to quality of life issues, functionality, mobility, and wellness. Again, further from the IOM report, because this has guided our behavior in the next few years. They identified disparities in disease burden among subgroups of women. Women are not a homogeneous population. And there are many women who are socially disadvantaged because of race, ethnicity, income level, educational attainment. And there must be targeted research, as we have just heard relative to FH, on the women with the highest risks and the burdens of disease. Again, from the Institute of Medicine, that the lack of analysis and reporting of sex stratified analyses limits the ability to identify potentially important sex and gender differences, including differences in care, and suggested to all of us as journal editors that we should require clinical trial outcomes to be presented separately for women and for men, or to say this was examined and there were no differences. 
and then translation of women's health research findings into clinical practice and public health policies, and effective communication of research-based health messages to women, to the public, to providers, and to policymakers. Then in 2011, we put out our women's prevention guidelines and identified some brand new areas. Again, here specific to women. And we highlighted that pregnancy complications, such as preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, pregnancy-induced hypertension, were all early indicators of increased cardiovascular risk. So that a detailed history of pregnancy complications is a routine component, or should be a routine component, of risk assessment for women. And we are trying now to see if we can get some guidelines as to how these women who are at increased risk should be followed over their adult life. We also identified again for the first time that women who had systemic autoimmune collagen vascular disease were at increased cardiovascular risk and recommended screening for these women. At the Emory Women's Heart Center, we have Emory cardiologists embedded in the preeclampsia follow-up clinic. We have them working with the rheumatologists in the lupus clinic, et cetera, so that these women are highlighted for cardiovascular risk screening where they get their care and enable this intervention to occur. Now, those of you who are classical scholars will recognize the story of Sisyphus, who pushes that boulder up and up and up the mountain only to have it roll back again. And for a while, this was the status of cardiovascular disease in women. But I think, at least in the US, we have begun to see some contemporary help for Sisyphus to get that boulder up the mountain. First relates to women in clinical trials. Women have been underrepresented in the mixed gender NIH trials, and even when they were included, they were disadvantaged because they were not specific sex-based analysis. Even though women were increased participants in clinical trials over time, only 20% of women were involved in the acute coronary syndrome trials can't make conclusions from small groups. And in a Cochrane review of some 250 cardiovascular disease trials, only a third of those trials examined the outcomes by sex. But among those who did so, 20%, one in five, reported significant differences in outcomes between women and men. And then I have another white horse I'm riding into battle and that is that the exclusion of elderly patients from clinical trials actually doubly disadvantages women because they have the predominance of coronary events at older age. So this is another clinical trials issue. And what did we have in the US? And this is the House Resolution 2101, the Research for All Act of 2015, which is now part of US law. It was introduced in April of 2015 and passed the next year, and it did two things. There was a mandate by the Government Accountability Office to update the reports on women and minority inclusion in medical research, both at the National Institutes of Health and at the Food and Drug Administration. And the National Institutes of Health had two mandates. First, to ensure that both male and female cells, tissues, and animals were included in basic research. You know, most of the animals of the animal studies were male. Male rats are cheaper than female rats, so they use male rats. And you ask the basic scientists, where did the tissues or the cells come from? Did they come from male or female animals? They didn't have the vaguest idea. So very often, studies of women's problems were being studied in male animals and male tissues and male cells. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is over. Now, the, FD, the NIH was further ordered that in clinical research, the results have to be disaggregated according to sex and the sex differences examined, and 
emphasis on the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical research, and that is part of the task of all of our study sections. Within the Food and Drug Administration, we have to ensure that drug trials for expedited approval are sufficient to ensure the safety and effectiveness, both for women and for men, again, supported by the results of clinical trials that separately evaluate outcome by sex. I want to add one more feature in terms of women's health research, because I've said many times that women's cardiovascular health is not solely a medical issue. It depends to a great extent on the local, medical, global community in which women reside. So my contribution is that cardiovascular health research in the next decade or decades should include issues of beliefs and behaviors, of community, local, national, and global, of economic issues, of environmental issues. Ethical issues is a very important component, but also must have legislative, political, public policy, society, and sociocultural issues. This is why I think it is important to study gender differences in coronary heart disease, and I thank you for your attention. Dr. Wenger, we would like to present you with a Pioneer Award from the FH Foundation. You are an inspiration as a scientist and as a woman and as an advocate, and um, we thank you for joining us.